Hello there friends and welcome, as promised in my summoner guide, this time we have my first ever BG3 full build, a circle of the sports druid, my favorite class ever in the game so far. Which by the way happens to be the best summoner as well for both normal and undead summons as it's the only class that gets the very fun fungal zombies you can see here. Just from my spawn druid alone I have around 10 summons, 4 unique to spawn druid and 2 to the normal druid. Which is why I say I prefer it instead of the necromancer wizard. Your mushroom druid won't be just about summoning however because you're quite the versatile character for starters. Right at level 2 you'll get one of the most busted abilities in the game that can enhance your hit points by absurd amounts up to 300 even later or even something like 50 right at level 2 together with extra actions for damage and even more damage added to your attacks permanently as necrotic quite fitting for a necromancer druid and of course by virtue of being a full spellcaster you also have spells for every situation including damage, crowd control, buffing and debuffing, plus summoning of course. So without further ado, let us get started into our Circle of the Spores, Druid Summoner and Necromancer build. First, with the main mechanics unique to our archetype. You actually gain two abilities right at level 2 as a Circle of the Spores Druid. First, Symbiotic Entity, which is the basis for all of your other abilities. And to put it simply, it's one of the most busted archetype abilities in the whole game, especially for how early you get it. Here's how it goes. First, you'll gain 4 temporary hit points equal to your druid level, which means even just at level 2, it's already 8 temporary HP. Which is of course great, because the enemy has to first reduce your temporary HP before getting into your true amount. It works like an energy shield of sorts, making sure your character will remain safe. As I said, it scales with level, and the effect is extremely powerful, right? 8 at level 2, meanwhile at level 12 you have 48 temporary hit points, that's around half your total HP. It will last until the following long rest, and only costs a single wild shape charge to activate. And here's the best part. By default you already start with 2 wild shape charges, and they are actually recharged on a short rest, right? Which means your character potentially has 6 entire uses of this ability per long rest. To put it simply, it's 4 times your class level as temporary HP times 6. You really never run out of temporary HP, which is part of what makes Circle of the Spores Druid so tanky and adept at survival. The benefits don't stop there, however, because as a Circle of Spores Druid you also gain a second ability just at level 2 as well, called Halo of Spores. You can use this as a reaction, right, so it won't cost your main or bonus actions, to inflict 1d4 necrotic damage on an enemy. The range is short, but decent enough. It does offer a constitution saving throw, however, and if the enemy saves they won't take any damage, but well, it's a reaction, right, so it's not like it costs anything that important, especially for the early parts of the game. And, as if that was not enough, while Symbiotic Entity is active, it doesn't just grant you temporary hit points, it also increases the damage of your Halo of Spores to twice the amount. So it's 2 to 8 damage as a reaction as early as level 2. It's especially good to remove concentration effect from enemy casters, because it's 2 instances of damage applied at once, thus forcing 2 concentration saves. Last but not least, Symbiotic Entity so busted it offers another benefit too. All of your melee and ranged attacks will deal an additional 1d6 necrotic damage, which of course is permanent, right, because it's until long rest. Like I said, I don't think there's any other low-level special archetype class ability in the game so stacked as Symbiotic Entity. Just be aware that it will not work with spell damage, however. Also, Symbiotic Entity cannot be used in conjunction with Wild Shape. If you turn into an animal form, Symbiotic Entity will be turned off. Which is part of why, ideally, you want your Mushroom Druid to have decent chances of hitting the enemy either at melee or ranged, and with Dexterity we can have both. At level 6 you get your second and the most unique Spore Druid ability, which is also part of what makes them great summoners and necromancers. Fungal Infestation. 
With this, you can reanimate either a beast or humanoid corpse, including even chickens and pets, into a fungal zombie. You have 4 charges of it per long rest, which means you do get 4 zombies per Spore Druid character. It even costs a reaction only, which is great for using it during battle if you want. The fungal zombies are mostly the same as the normal zombie from Animate Dead, which is why I say the Spore Druid is the best Necromancer. After all, you can then combine 4 fungal zombies with your Animate Dead summons, which can be either skeletons or more zombies, right? The Necromancer Wizard doesn't really get something like this, unfortunately. You still retain access to all the wild shapes if you want to, including the very powerful Obear. It's just going to take away some of your Spore Druid bonuses. Now, the last circle of Spore's unique ability is gained at level 10, and it's quite good too. Spreading Spores. While Symbiotic Entity is active, you can use the Spreading Spore ability as a bonus action to create a cloud of spores that use 2d8 necrotic damage, although enemies can make a constitution save for no effect. However, because the cloud will linger, every single turn they are inside they have to make the save or take the damage. Lastly, this will not work on allies, right? It has no friendly fire, which is great too. Just be careful because, let's say during Act 3, when you are at certain cities and crowded areas, it does work on neutral NPCs, right? Which might well, kill them or make them hostile against you, so be careful. Now, because it's cast as a bonus action, you have a very fun and quite efficient combo that you can do as a Spore Druid. Remember that your Halo of Spores is cast as a reaction, so you can combine a main attack with the Symbiotic Entity Necrotic Boost to it, or a spell cast, to get with Halo of Spores as a reaction, and then spreading Spores as a bonus action all in the same turn. Quite fun and efficient as I said. Even if the damage is not absurdly amazing or anything, it can add up. Now that we know the best Spore Druid unique abilities, let's finally get into our Spore Druid build, first with character creation. Now when it comes to race, my preferred pick is Elf, right? Mostly because of the fact by default, Druids have very poor ranged weapon proficiencies, Let's say you are a Tifling. The only ranged weapon we have is Javelins, which aren't particularly useful because as thrown weapons, well, they are based on your strength, and ideally we want to max dexterity for all of the great bonuses besides just attack, like armor class, saving throws against a lot of spell damage, initiative, and so on. Don't forget, in Baldur's Gate 3, dexterity works for both range to damage and to hit. Elves, on the other hand, can avoid that, because you'll get proficiency with short bows and, most importantly, long bows for free. And as I said before, it's in your best interest to have a good weapon to attack with your Spore Druid because of your extra necrotic damage for free permanently on hit. And ideally, Wood Elf, because the extra movement speed can be quite fun, especially for your short range Spore Druid abilities like Halo of Spores and the Spore Cloud for hit-and-run tactics if needed. Besides, as a druid yourself, you have access to the very powerful Long Strider spell for even higher movement, right? So you can stack it to dash through a lot of the map with just your normal movement. However, there is a certain pair of gloves in the game called the Gloves of Archery that you can buy from the Goblin Camp Merchant extremely early in the game. And while it will grant you proficiency with bows for free, together with also increasing your range damage by plus two. So it's not like you necessarily have to be an elf, right? Other nice picks are Tifling and Zeriel for the free smite powers at level 3 and 5. Although they require concentration and as a druid, you kind of have a lot of other nice concentration effects. Besides that, you can truly go with anything you want, really. And for this guide, I'll even be going with human, right? The most bland race of them all. Just to show you that race isn't that important. Don't feel restricted by Elf or any other race. Go with what you want, depending on role-playing, thematics or cosmetics. It's up to you. Githyanki has some nice powers too, especially the free teleport later on. Something you can do if you aren't going with Elf, at least for the very early game, is to get high strength instead of dexterity, just so you can use javelins properly until you get these gloves, but you can easily rush for them, like, very fast. Then once you get the gloves, 
respect for dexterity instead, as I'll show you now for the ability points. Well, first we actually have cantrips. And as far as spells and cantrips, please remember that I've just released a best spells guide for the game covering pretty much all classes and spells from all levels. So for now, I'll just keep it short and simple. If you want more in-depth explanations as to why I'm picking these spells here, just check this guide out. Anyways, guidance to boost skill checks to the max even early. And you might as well pick Thorn Whip. The other cantrip doesn't matter much, because like I said, if you want to attack, you'll either be casting through spells or going with a ranged weapon. For the background, this is up to you depending on what skills you want your character to further specialize in. Since skills are also tied to ability points, let's cover them first. Ideally, you don't want anything less than 16 Wisdom, right? It's your main casting stat, and Druids have amazing spells. Buffing, debuffing, crowd control, damage, they have everything, even summoning, of course, which they excel at. 16 Dexterity is also a must-have for all of the nice bonuses it provides, as I've already covered. What you can do now is have one of these stats, either Dexterity or Wisdom, at 17 during character creation, so that even at level 4 you can already have 20 by accepting the Hag's gift, which you get of course by defeating the Hag boss at chapter 1. It's up to you if you want to go with higher Dexterity or Wisdom, I prefer Wisdom, because like I said we have a lot of amazing spells, and the higher our Wisdom, the higher the chances of them working. It also helps with insight and perception checks. Meanwhile, Dexterity will grant you higher initiative, armor class, and of course, higher two hit and damage. It's just that as a druid, unless you go with potions of haste, you are restricted with one attack per round. Ranged anyways, with wild shape you can get more, but then you lose some of the spawn druid abilities. Now for the other stats, they don't really matter much. Outside of 14 constitution, I wouldn't go any lower because it helps you have nice hit points, even if you already have an absurd amount of temporary HP as a fungal druid. For the last stat, I would just go with charisma. It doesn't matter that much, but since you are the main character, it can help later with making the dialogue checks, right? Persuasion, intimidate, and deception. Just go with backgrounds that further enhance skills you want to have on your character, right? A good example is Charlatan, for sleight of hand. If you don't want to use, let's say, Asterion, you'll still be able to unlock chests and disarm traps because we have decent enough dexterity together with proficiency. Deception can help for dialogue checks too. I like to go with Noble, right, for persuasion, together with history, mostly persuasion, but you can also go with Soldier if you prefer intimidation instead, and athletics. As I said, it's up to you. It's just that as a druid, you can't really add proficiency in, let's say, the dialogue checks otherwise. And as far as your skill proficiencies, definitely insight. We already have perception from being an elf, which is great. And the other one is up to you. Animal handling can help, but there aren't that many checks of it. Or survival. You'll have high ranks in both, it's up to you. For spells, just on a quick note, healing word, fairy fire, absolutely amazing. Long strider. And let's say Animal Friendship, which fits the Druid a lot. For level 2, be sure to choose Circle of Spores, of course, and add Fog Cloud. Enhanced Leap can work too. For level 3 as new spells, the game will keep trying to make you prepare Ice Knife, just ignore it. And what you want is absolutely Spike Growth, busted good early game for melting enemies. Pass Without a Trace can be chosen if you want higher stealth checks, but it requires concentration, so kinda clashes with, let's say, Fairy Fire, Fall Cloud, and so on. And besides that, you can, let's say, ignore Fall Cloud and go for Moonbeam, quite a handy and efficient low-level spell. For level 4, pick any cantrip you want, the remaining ones don't really matter. Prepare any spell to, now as far as our feet, for this level you actually want an ability improvement, right? And as I said, either Dexterity or Wisdom, so that with the Hex Gift you can get 20 right at this level, for the maximum possible. For level 5 you'll get Animate Dead for free, which is great to get started on our Undead army. And as spells, be sure to go for Call Lightning, which is also amazing and very efficient, just like Moonbeam. The other choice is up to you. Level 6 is huge for a sport with, as I've covered before, we just got Animate Dead at the previous level, and now we have our Fungal Zombies, which stack together with the ones from Animate Dead, of course. At level 7, as a Mushroom Druid, you'll get Confusion added for free, 
which can help because as a druid you are missing spells like Hypnotic Pattern or Slow for Area of Effect crowd control. But be sure to absolutely pick both Conjure Woodland Bean and also Conjure Minor Elemental at this level. You actually have 4 summons from these spells at once. Together with your undead fun stuff, of course. So at this point is when you really start getting into a big summon army as a Spore Druid. For level 8, because we can already potentially have 20 in our stat by now, I'd rather pick a feat. Of course, you can also choose to increase the stat you didn't before. Since I went with Wisdom, you can go with, let's say, Dexterity. It's up to you. Now, a feat I really enjoy picking for most casters, at least when they have the space to spare, is Warcaster, right? With this, you have advantage on saving throws to maintain concentration, which means, of course, the chances of making the checks is way higher. Concentration spells are the best in the game, especially crowd control and buffing. And losing our spells because you took damage, well, to me, is quite annoying. With this, we can at least increase our chances of avoiding that. You can also pick Sharpshooter because even though we only have one attack or two with haste, you do have nice damage boosts added to them. And at this point as a druid, you have enough buffs and debuffs to make up for the penalty. I mean, plus 10 to the damage of a ranged attack is a really big boost. But like I said, it's not necessary. There's also alert for a plus 5 to initiative, which is huge in this game. It will pretty much always ensure you act first. And alpha strikes are as always powerful. And these are pretty much the best picks here. I'd rather Warcaster, because I hate losing spells because I took damage. And in this game, even if you take just a single point of damage, it already forces a DC 10 concentration check. Or just go with the other choices I mentioned. I like providing them for you so you can pick whatever you want. For level 9, be sure to pick Conjure Elemental, one of the best summons in the game. At level 10, you get your very nice area of effect spreading spores ability, any cantrip here, and any spell too. As for level 11, ideally you want to upcast Conjure Elemental as a level 6 spell for the Elemental Myrmidons. But besides that, Hero's Feast is an amazing buff, party-wide and for summons too. And Wall of Thorns can have its use as if you like shoving enemies back into the wall and so on. But as a concentration effect, well, it depends on what you want, you can go with this. I'd rather something like Fairy Fire to sharply reduce the enemy's chance of avoiding our attacks, especially for a summoner. After all, you can only have one concentration effect on at the same time. For our last feat at level 12, well, the choice is also up to you, there's the ones I mentioned before. Something else you can do is pick Lucky, even at level 8. Because at the very least, this can be spammed one after the other, and it can help you both avoid attacks or make attacks yourself, right? It's quite versatile in what it does, even if it's limited to just 3 uses per long rest. Or like I said, just increase, it, let's say, your dexterity to 20 at this point, it's up to you. Well, alright, now let us get into gear for our Circle of Spores Druid. For the helmet, ultimately Hood of the Weave, if you want the highest DC boost possible, but early on you can also go with the Fist Breaker Helm for half the amount, right? Plus 1 to DC instead of plus 2. The plus 1 to initiative is quite handy as well, because we do have decent dexterity. And you can also go with the Circle of Bones to grant you an aura that makes all undead allies inside fully resistant to all physical damage is quite good for your necro army but of course as an aura you can just leave this to another character for cloaks cloak of the weave once again for plus one to dc i'll be focusing dc for a lot of the gear choices here because look druid has amazing dc spells right for both damage crowd control and debuffing for armor you have a few different choices the ultimate one i'd say is the armor of the spore keeper because Unlike all other pieces of gear, this one does have unique benefits for a Spore Keeper Druid, right? It's made just for your class. First, the Malefic Fungus ability, you'll get a plus one to spell DC. Also, when dealing necrotic damage, you'll deal an additional point, which can help as both our Spreading Spores and Halo of Spores deal necrotic, together with our weapon attacks on hit as well. Lastly, you do gain some unique abilities too. While you are under the symbiotic entity effect, so always, 
you'll get to cast either Tin Mask Spores, which can be photo enemies, as an area of effect with some minor poison damage, Bieber Bank Spores for noxious fumes and more poison damage, and last but not least, the best one of course, Haste Spores, which for a summoner build is quite good. You'll create an area of effect, and any ally moving through will get the haste benefit. The only downside is it only lasts one turn, but the cloud will persist for a while. It's definitely enough for one battle at least, and you can always just keep moving summons into it, then attack for the haste, move out so there's more space for other summons and so on. The only downside is all of the spore abilities you get from this armor, well, they are once per long rest. Sadly, no spamming haste on every battle. Oh, this also doesn't require concentration and can be cast as a bonus action as well, which is really good. Earlier in the game, however, you have a few different choices. There's, for example, the Protectee Sparks Wall Robes for plus 1 to DC. There's other robes that do the same too. And of course, both the Armor of Agility and the Yuanti Armor, which are unique in that, despite being medium armor, they let you apply all your dexterity modifier to AC, right? So they're the best armors for tanking. Although you don't really need it as a sport druid with close to 300 extra hit points on demand. And yes, druids can wield up to medium armor, including shields. And by the way, I'm pretty sure they can even wield metal armor too, unlike other DD games. For gloves, as I mentioned earlier in this guide, gloves of archery are amazing if you didn't go with high elf, right? to grant you proficiency with long bows. Other than that, late game at least, if you want higher DC, you can go with the Nether Stone Gauntlet of the Tyrant. For boots, I don't think there's that many good boots in the game, at least not for a druid, so I just went with ones that increase our jumping distance, but go with anything you want. And I'm all ears for nice boots in BG3 recommendations, right? There's so much in the game after all. Besides that, for the amulet slot, Spell Crux is my preferred pick here, because the spell slot restoration ability is amazing. Once per long rest, you can replenish any spell slot of any level, ideally level 6 spells, right? Once you get them anyways, you get this amulet earlier, because you only have a single, even at level 12. But it's amazing overall, and you don't even need to keep it equipped after using it. By the way, you cannot cheese this amulet by equipping it on other characters, right, the ability will be spent anyways. There's also a pearl stone amulet you can acquire, I believe, at the Mushroom Colony in the Underdark, that has a similar ability. Now, for rings you have a few different options. I like the Caustic Band, also from the Myconid Colony, because it lasts your weapon attacks deal 2 extra acid damage. I know it's not much, but it's pretty fun to have your weapon deal physical, then acid, and then necrotic by virtue of being a spore druid even if you only have a single attack by default. Another amazing pick, also for extra physical damage purposes, is the Strange Conduit Ring. So long as you are concentrating on a spell, and as a druid you always be, your attacks will do an additional 1d4 psychic damage. So with these two rings you have physical, acid, necrotic and psychic on hit, to overcome your single attack limitation. Other than that, mostly the Shapeshifter's Boom Ring, because it's quite OP, you can even get it early by cheesing the weird ox enemy at the Druid Glove, I mean you'll have to kill it, and it does have some quests later on, so beware of that. Otherwise you'll get it at the start of Act 3. Anyways, while Shapeshifting or disguising yourself, you'll get 1d4 to all checks, not actually attack rolls I believe, or damage, but definitely all skill checks, which is what makes it amazing. You can get it under Wild Shape, but for our Druid, it's much better to combine it with the Mask of the Shapeshifter, which grants you this guy's self an infinite amount of times anyways, even if you want to equip it for something else, while benefiting from the Ring Boost. Now let's talk about weapons. For melee weapons, I like Staffs, because they often have nice benefits. Usually when it comes to increasing spell DC, right, I have the legendary quarter staff here, Marco Hashkir, not sure if that's how you pronounce it, but it's quite good. It grants plus one to spell DC, together with the ability to replenish any spell of any level, right, so we already have double or triple with our amulets. The Kareshka's favorability can be nice too, but it's better for elemental damage casters. We are more focused into necrotic damage, on the other hand. But there's other staffs that grant plus one to DC at least. The first one, I believe, being Melf's first staff from the Underdark. Oh, and I almost forgot. 
the Fowler Aluve Long Sword can also be amazing. For any character really, but especially summoners. It's actually a finessable weapon despite being a long sword, so will work based on your dexterity. Even better if you went with Elf, right? Because they do have free proficiency with long swords. But since what you want is the weapon ability, you won't really be attacking with it anyways. There's two you can choose per short rest. Sing, which highly increases the attack rolls of allies, amazing for summons of course, or Shriek, which on the other hand highly increases the damage enemies take, also great. Because it works based on an aura surrounding your character, right? If you want the extra damage, slap it on, let's say, someone like Shadowheart, who as a cleric will be closer to enemies. Otherwise, for summon boosting, you can put it on whoever, so long as they are close to most of your summons. For shields, you can wield them as a druid. Later, I will just go for Catherick's shield, because it's a very special shield that also increases spell DC. So it's amazing for spellcasters. And one of the reasons I really recommend your casters have shield proficiency for, let's say, wizards and sorcerers, you can go with humans. As far as ranged weapons, which will be your main source of physical damage, you have a few different choices. I have the legendary bow here, which is nice, but not exactly necessary for this build that only gets one ranged blow anyways. Earlier, you can go with the Jolt Shooter, and there's also the Dead Shot for higher critical chance and attack bonuses with bows, or just something like the Dark Fire Short Bow for resistance to both fire and cold damage. There's also another bow earlier that grants advantage against monstrosity enemies, right from the Grove Merchant. And that's pretty much it. Well, alright, friends, so this was it for my Circle of the Spores Druid build. If you found this guide useful as always, please remember to like, subscribe and also consider becoming a channel member if you can. I truly really appreciate your support. Thank you for watching and see you next time, friends, most likely with the wizard Necro build.